Thank you and be seated. Man, it, it's good to be in the house of the Lord today. <clears throat> and I am, I, I hope you're enjoying going through Luke at least half as much as I am because I'm having a great time. I am really enjoying what God is telling us through the book of uh, Luke. And uh, we are today in chapter five. Luke has helped us to see who Jesus is, who's son he is. He's made the case that he is the, the son of God. We've seen Jesus withstand the temptation of the devil and he has shown himself faithful in all things. Uh, we've seen him declare himself the Messiah through reading the scripture there at Nazareth and saying that today this is fulfilled in your ears. We've seen him showing his power in confronting the demons and healing people of diseases. He's bringing the, uh, the blessings of the coming kingdom. So the kingdom is invading and he's revealing who he is. He's preaching in the synagogues around Galilee. And now in chapter five, Luke, remember, he's telling this to Theophilus. He, he introduced this to in chapter one, those first four verses. And Theophilus means beloved of God. We are God's beloved. This is written to us. And so it's like Luke is giving us our own private tutelage in who Jesus is. And he tells this story in the first 11 verses of Luke 5. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. And he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. <clears throat> Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. <clears throat> and when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we've toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with them were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you'll be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. You know, it is, it's really a, a unique experience if you're ever sitting out in a crowd and, and somebody picks you out, someone calls your name. Someone says, hey, Ethan, I, I see you sitting there. And man, how does that make you feel? It makes you feel sort of a little, little strange, but man, it's nice to be noticed. It, I see you there, Stan, there you are, right there, I, I, I see you. And uh, when, Someone picks you out of the multitude, picks you out of the crowd, you sort of feel it. This is Jesus picking Peter out of the crowd and Jesus dealing with Peter even in the middle of all that is going on. And, and this is Luke telling us that Peter's going to be pretty important in the story of Jesus. You know, in all the list of the disciples, in all the gospels, Peter's always listed first. Peter plays a prominent role in the book of Acts. He preaches on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people come to faith in Christ that day. Peter is ultimately going to give his life for the sake of the gospel. And his story is a long and varied one, but extremely important in the life of the church. It's Peter who's first going to say that he knows that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. And so Luke's introduction of Peter really matters. Notice that as he tells us the story of Jesus' initial call of Peter, Jesus, the first time that Jesus picks Peter out of the crowd, that it comes in 
the midst of other things that's going on. Uh, Luke tells us that uh, Jesus was going around Galilee. He's preaching in the synagogues, but he's preaching really pretty much anywhere. And people are noticing him. In fact, he's become quite popular because notice it says in verse 1 that on one occasion while the crowd was pressing in on him. Now if you've ever been to Israel and if you've not been I'd love to have you go with us. We, we learn so much when we go but the, the Sea of Galilee sits 600 feet below sea level. It's surrounded by mountains and hills and so Jesus grew up one of those hills up on top at a town called Nazareth but now He's going around these cities in Galilee that are on the shore like uh, Magdala and Tiberias and Capernaum. And he's preaching in those synagogues and he's teaching people. Well, on this particular day, he's there by the Sea of Galilee and it's sort of like a natural amphitheater. And as he's preaching, as he's teaching, notice it says the, what he's teaching is the word of God. The, the crowd presses in on him. They want to be near him. Now, you know, a lot of times you see these movies like The Greatest Story Ever Told or uh, The Passion of the Christ. And sometimes you see movies that have Jesus teaching in them. I don't know if you've noticed this, but he always sounds boring to me in those movies. It's like, blessed all the peacemakers. <laughs> There's no way people are pressing in to get that kind of delivery. Jesus is engaging. Jesus is connecting with people. They want to hear what he says. Uh, his delivery is, is dynamite, if you will. I mean, they want to hear this man speak so much that the crowd presses in and he's backed up toward the lake. So he sees these two boats down there uh, and he gets in one. He, he, he tells them, he tells Peter, sort of the captain of this boat, hey, push out into the deep a little bit. And now apparently maybe tired from having stood so long, having the crowd press in on you, a little bit off the shore in this natural amphitheater because those, those mountains rise right from the shore. They go on up about 600 feet. And the crowd standing there, Jesus can sit in the boat. His voice can be heard. It projects over the water. And he begins to teach. And he, he teaches the word of God. Now, he's going to call Peter. He's going to use this very specific situation to call Peter into his service but notice what, how that call of God comes after some things. First of all, it comes after learning who Jesus is. Uh, Jesus has revealed himself. This isn't the first time Jesus has encountered Peter because remember up in verse 38 and 39 uh, of Luke 4, he went to Peter's house and there he healed his mother-in-law. And she got up and served them. So we know that Jesus has already had at least one, perhaps other encounters with Peter. So here we know that Jesus has become a popular figure as evidenced by the, the crowds. So Peter doesn't just hear the voice of a stranger. He, he knows a little bit about Jesus. He's learned who Jesus is. But also it comes after learning from Jesus. So he doesn't just hear who Jesus is, he hears what Jesus says. The people come to hear the word of God. So Jesus sitting in the boat teaches them. And think about it, Jesus, Peter's boat becomes Jesus' pulpit from which he cast out his gospel net over his hearers. And he's, he, Jesus is drawing in men and women and this is exactly what he's going to teach Peter to do. He's going to turn him into a fisher of men. So you see Jesus doing precisely what he's going to disciple Peter to do. He's, Peter is learning from Jesus as well, after learning who Jesus is. And thirdly, he's listening to Jesus. Because after this period of Jesus teaching, Jesus now says, hey, uh, put your, your, your boat out. And he goes out of his way to involve Peter by entering his boat. Now, if you go to Israel today, there on the Sea of Galilee, one of the most fascinating things you can see is a thing called the Jesus boat. Now, you can, don't do it now. Don't pull out your phones. Don't pull out your iPads. But you can Google this later. 
since you won't be watching a game at one o'clock, you can, you can do this. And uh, the Jesus boat, uh, about, I don't know, 10 years ago, they discovered this boat in the mud, covered with mud, uh, and it's a 2,000-year-old boat. And the, the painstaking way that they extracted that from the mud, the way they, they covered it with this silicon-like stuff, and, and they got it into uh, its own, they house it in a, it's basically at uh, a, a little farm there, a kibbutz, and you can go in and see it and see the video about the way they restored it. And it is literally 2,000 years old. Is it possible? It belonged to Peter. It's possible. Uh, we don't know, but it is at least contemporary. It might have been one of the boats that was around there that Jesus could have entered in. We don't know. There's no way of knowing that. But we do know that it's contemporary with Jesus. And so you can see the dimensions of it. Uh, I don't know, I'm going to guess it's about 25 feet long. This would be a pretty average length for one of those boats. It would, it would hold several fishermen in there because they use two different kinds of nets. So during the day, they use a smaller net and they fish in shallow water where they can see the fish. But at night, they use a much heavier net and they throw into the deep water and they can catch larger fish and more fish with that, that big thick net. Now, in fact, in this story, uh, Luke uses the word for the nighttime net, the one that is thrown at night and, and can hold more. And in fact, we see that it gets so many fish, it begins to break, which would really be an accomplishment because those nets were designed to hold a lot of fish. But uh, Jesus enters into this boat and he tells them, he tells Peter, he says, put out into the deep. Now this, this word put out is imperative and it's singular. It's directed specifically at Peter who's steering the vessel. But the next verb that Jesus says, let down your net is plural. So Jesus is speaking to Peter individually and he's speaking to the group of fishermen. So after Jesus teaches a while, these guys are over there washing their net. They've been using those nets all night long, so they would wash them in the morning and they would make sure they're getting the whatever vegetation is in them out. They would make sure that there's no hole in the net so that they lose any fish. So they're going through this and Jesus tells them to put out into the deep water uh, and let down your nets, and let down, plural, to all of them, let down your nets for a catch. And Peter has to listen to what Jesus says and notice his response. Now, Master, uh, th by the way, Luke uses a word in Matthew and Mark that's usually rabbi. Luke uses the, the Greek word that he chooses to translate from the Aramaic is the word master or teacher because Theophilus, remember, is not a Jew. He's a Gentile, he's like you and me. And the word rabbi, sort of a loaded word uh, and may not have significance, but uh, uh, epistata, master, teacher does to Theophilus, a Greek. So Luke uses that word, Peter says, master. Now look, we're professionals. We've done this a long time. We know what we're doing. We've toiled all night. We've done this all night long. Now what's the implication when Peter says that? Nothing's going to happen. I, I'm, I'm not going to be rude and refuse you, Jesus. But I don't want you to be disappointed either. We've been doing this all night. Nothing's going to happen. Nevertheless, at your word, we'll, we'll do it. Uh, at your word, I'll let down the nets. And notice the first person there. I will let down the nets. Now, Here's, Jesus is knocking on Peter's door. Jesus is showing up and he's going to deal specifically with Peter. But notice what's getting in Peter's way. When God begins to show up in your life, when God begins to knock on your door, when Jesus begins to deal specifically with you, there are some obstacles that might get in your way. The very first one you see right here in verse 5 is disbelief. Disbelief. 
Peter thinks he knows best. Peter thinks that he knows how to do this, uh, and he responds in two ways. One is Peter the fisherman saying, we've toiled all night. He uses a word here for this laborious work. We've, we've endured all night long, and their fishing remembers not this. You can sort of do this all night. That's not very tiring, even though if you did it all night, maybe your wrist will get sore or something, but they're doing this all night. Big, heavy nets, wet, drawing them back in, throwing them out, drawing them back in. All night long, you're throwing a big, wet net and pulling it back in. And you know, when you're catching fish, there's an adrenaline rush, man. You can do that all day. You, you just keep fishing, keep fishing. I remember one time David Hatcher and I went fishing up in the Amazon, place where we go for peacock bass. Man, there's just nothing like getting into a school of peacock bass. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. There's these little fish called matrichon that are basically bait fish. And you'll be going along in your boat and you'll see these matrichon could go the distance of this sanctuary in two seconds. I'm not exaggerating that. It's like, zzz, they look like they're rocket powered. And Ben, you see a school of those things going across the top of the water, throw there, man, throw right now. Get in there because there is a school of big tukunade, peacock bass, after those mantrishan. And one day we caught 70 in the space of about 30 minutes. I'm talking big, gorgeous fish. I wasn't a bit tired. We got back to my house and, man, I, I couldn't even go to sleep that night. I, I, I was casting in my sleep all night long, <laughs> catching those fish. Catch, there was no part of me that was tired, but man, there's been other times we've gone up there. We'd leave Manaus three o'clock in the morning so we could be at Balbina where we go fishing by before 30 minutes before daylight. Guy, our guide meets us there with a boat. We leave as soon as the sun begins to peek up over that horizon at 6 a.m. as it always does on the equator. It doesn't vary at all during the year. And so 6 a.m. we're across with, we go for about two hours upstream and Man, we fish, we fish. You see incredible things. You, you see pink dolphins, freshwater dolphins. You, you see uh, these little river otters. You, you see uh, capybara over on the shore. Uh, you see caiman, these alligators all over the place. You, you see all these incredible stuff, but what you're there for is fish. And you know, by one o'clock, if you've not caught anything, it's tiring, you know. I mean, you're, then you're looking at each other going, what do you think? Uh, there's a chuascaria in my house waiting on us, man. You know, a Brazilian steakhouse. We can either sit out here catching nothing or we go back to my house and get some picanha, some Brazilian steak. And, you know, if you've not caught anything, you, you just give up. Let's go. Nothing to this. But, man, when you're catching... The adrenaline rush keeps you going. They, there's no adrenaline rush. These guys are tired. They're done. They're already washing their nets. They're through for the night. And here Jesus says, throw out in the deep. The disbelief. Now, Lord, I know what I'm doing. I've been running my life and my business for a lot of years. And notice Peter doesn't just believe him he, he argues a little bit and there's only one way to overcome the obstacle of disbelief and that's with a change of belief we've got to realize that the words of Jesus are life we have to come to believe that he is God's agent that the only way we can be saved from our pointlessness and our faithlessness is to listen to Jesus and to do what he says and so Peter doesn't really believe Jesus yet. Nevertheless, okay, we're going to do it. Don't expect anything, Jesus. Don't be disappointed, Jesus, when nothing happens. But at your word, we'll do it. And he throws out, and suddenly there, there are so many fish that the net begins to break when they pull it in. Now, let me ask you a question. What, what kind of a miracle is this? Is this a miracle of knowledge? That is that Jesus simply knows where the fish are. Or is this a miracle of will? 
that Jesus wills the fish to that place. It really doesn't matter. It's still a miracle. I mean, Jesus is the carpenter's son, right? He, this isn't what Jesus does, and yet Jesus knows. You know, I had an argument with a liberal friend of mine one time. He claimed that Jesus didn't know everything. He asked me the question. He said, he said, like, do you think Jesus knew Portuguese? I said, man, I know Portuguese. It's discomforting to me to, to believe that I know more than Jesus about anything. I said, you honestly think Jesus didn't know Portuguese? He said, yeah, of course Jesus didn't know Portuguese. No, it hadn't even been invented yet. I said, you know, if Jesus is God, he knows everything. Now, in his earthly person, did he willfully limit his knowledge sometimes? He may have, but that was still God simply choosing to not access knowledge. It's not that he didn't have it. So maybe this is a miracle of knowledge. Maybe Jesus simply knows the fish are there. Maybe it's a miracle of will. Jesus just sends out the signal to all the fish in that lake that he has created and for whose glory ex they exist. And he just said, hey, get in this foolish man's net right now. And they do it. Either way, Jesus performs a miracle. And they begin to try and pull it up, and it's so full that it, it begins to break. Notice the next obstacle, obstacle, therefore, is success. Success. If God gives you success in the things you are attempting, what are you going to do with it? Because Peter's a fisherman. His whole purpose, he's out there to catch fish, and now he's got more fish than he's ever had, more fish than he even dreamed of having, more fish than he ever expected to have. And now the question is, okay, Peter, you've got what you wanted. You wanted fish? Here they are. Here's all you could ever hope for and want. Now what are you going to do? And the only way you're going to get over the obstacle of success is to change your values. See, suddenly Peter has everything he ever wanted, but he doesn't want what he has. Fish rot, or they're consumed, or they're sold, but what they don't do is get you into heaven. What good is success in life and failure in spiritual things? You know, one of the, one of the greatest problems you'll ever have in following Christ is success in life? Haven't you ever had that experience where, you, you know, the reality is most of us sitting here right now, if you're a person, an adult, you have more right now than you ever dreamed even 10 years ago you'd have. You, you know, when Tony and I first married, I mean, you talk about broke. We had nothing. And now we, we get to travel, we get to do things, we have things. We, it's, it's unimaginable. I, 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 I know my mom and dad lived in a parsonage their whole lives and got to the end of their life. And if it hadn't have been for the, really the kindness of my, my grandmother, they wouldn't have had a, a house. And I've got a house, I've, I've got stuff. And yet, isn't it true that the stuff we possess often gets in the way of our service to the Lord? Like, if God called you right now and he said, okay, I want you to go to China. I want you to do what you're trained to do in China so that you can use your life to bring people to Christ in a country that is closed to the gospel. I mean... You know what the main consideration for most people would be? Well, what do I do with all this stuff? Or, you know, man, that's just such an ordeal to move. We've weighed ourselves down with so much stuff that our success is an obstacle to following Christ. And the only way you overcome that obstacle is you've got to change your values and realize that's not success at all. That's not what God puts you on this earth to do, to just get more stuff. 
And then they have to always get a bigger place to put the more stuff that you got. And you get further and further away from his will. So Peter now has this success. He's got all these fish. And notice it says that they signal. The, the word Luke uses is a word for like not in your head. It's like, hey, come over here. Help us. We, we, we can't get these fish up. And so the other crew from the other boat, they come over. And apparently they get this net between them. And they begin to maybe to, to shovel the fish up into the boats. And the fish just keep coming. And the boats get so full of fish and men that now they've begun to sink. And trust me, having seen that boat, they're not the most seaworthy things. And, you know, especially if you, you pitch the bottom part of the boat, but you really don't count on the water ever getting up to the top parts of it. But when the boat begins to get so full of fish that it begins to sink, now that water is coming in through the, between those planks, the places where you didn't ever think the water would ever get up to. And now the boat begins to sink and, and they begin to cry out. Now the next obstacle that they face is disaster because success often brings its own form of misery. Let me, let me read you something. A guy named Charles Duhigg wrote an article in the New York Times Magazine. He describes his own experience. He got an MBA, Master of Business Administration from Harvard. And he writes, a Harvard MBA seemed like a winning lottery ticket a gilded highway to world-changing influence, fantastic wealth, and if those self-satisfied portraits that lined the hallways were any indication, a lifetime of deeply meaningful work. So it came as a bit of a shock when I attended my 15th reunion last summer to learn how many of my former classmates weren't overjoyed by their professional lives. In fact, they were miserable. I heard about one fellow alum who had run a large hedge fund until being sued by investors. Another person had risen to a senior role inside one of the nation's most prestigious companies before being savagely pushed out by corporate politics. Another had learned in the maternity ward that her firm was being stolen by a conniving partner. Those were extreme examples, of course. Most of us were living relatively normal, basically content lives, but even among my more sanguine classmates, there was a lingering sense of professional disappointment. They talked about missed promotions, disaffected children, and billable hours in divorce court. They complained about jobs that were unfulfilling, tedious, or just plain bad. One classmate described having to invest $5 million a day, which didn't sound terrible until he explained that if he put only $4 million to work on Monday, he had to scramble to play six million on Tuesday and his co-workers were constantly undermining one another in search of the next promotion. It was insanely stressful work done among people he didn't particularly like. He earned about $1.2 million a year and hated going to the office. I feel like I'm wasting my life, he told me. When I die, is anyone going to care that I earned an extra percentage point of return? My work feels totally meaningless. Now we, we sit here and let's, you know, you, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, I'd, I'd like to give a shot at $1.2 million worth a year of meaningless. <laughs> I, I, I understand. But I think we also know just looking over our lives, though subsistence living, living in poverty is extremely hard and very, very stressful in and of itself. But there comes a point at which you do realize as you accrue things, that this stuff doesn't make you happy. And, and if you just end up having to divide all your goods with an ex-spouse, you ask yourself if you missed the boat somewhere. Success can bring disaster in a life. It's, it's not a magic wand. It doesn't really change who you are. And it can sure be an obstacle to, to faith when that disaster comes. And you begin to look elsewhere. How can I fix it? How can I undo the damage I've done? Where can I go? The only way, the only way to 
reverse that. The only way to overcome that obstacle is with a change of perspective. Because if you're just filling the boat, but you're sinking it, you've got to see that the goal is not to fill the boat, but to have a satisfied soul. And thank you, Demika. Ah, I am trying, sister, man. This is good, I'll say it is good. If you're filling the boat, but sinking it, then you're missing the boat. You see, that disaster brings into your life that overwhelming sense that I, I don't know what I'm doing. And, and here they begin to cry to one another, come help, come help. But when somebody comes to help, they just drag them down too. They begin to sink too. And so then the next obstacle comes in verse 8 is fear. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees. How, how remarkable that when we realize who Jesus is, our first response is not joy or gratitude or love. Our first response is fear. Peter, seeing all this happen, he, in just an instant, he has success beyond his wildest dreams, but now he's got disaster. His boat, by which he makes his living, is sinking. And he looks at Jesus, the one whom only seconds ago he was saying, now, I know what I'm doing, but nevertheless, at your word, I'll do this just to appease you. And suddenly he realizes this is God's agent. This is God's man. And he falls down on his knees in fear. And we... When Jesus shows up, when Jesus starts to knock on our door, when Jesus starts to say, I want you, when Jesus starts to upend our plans, often our, our response is not, thank you, Lord. I'm willing for you to do anything in my life you want to do. Please, Lord, just have your will in your way. Our, our response is fear. Oh, well, Lord, what's this going to mean? What's this going to mean? You, you mean uh, you might send me somewhere? that uh, is away from my family. You might take the stuff I've spent all my life accruing. You might require of me something that I have not wanted to do. Lord, I, 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 now I want to go to heaven and all, but you're interfering with my life, and I'm afraid of that. But you know, the reality is you're fearing the wrong thing. And the only way to get rid of that fear is with a change of what you fear. Fear is not misplaced. Fear is the right response, but it's not fear of Jesus. You should fear success without Jesus. You should fear hell. You should fear trusting in yourself. But don't be afraid of the one who has come to satisfy your soul eternally. Don't be afraid of him. Peter falls to his knees. And look what he says, depart from me, depart from me. C.S. Lewis called Jesus the transcendental interferer. And that's exactly what he is. He, he's, he's come to interfere with your life. He's come to change your plans. He's come to, to overwhelm your, your source of satisfaction. He's come to show you that success is not what you thought it was. And, you don't need to fear him. You need to, you need to fear running from him. Peter falls. He says, depart from me for I am a sinful man. I'm a sinful man. Now Peter's come to the, the next obstacle. It's sinfulness. Sinfulness. Lord, I can't serve you. I'm broken. I, I'm, I have messed up so badly. Lord, I'm just, I can't be of any use to you because I have made bad decisions and wrong choices. Lord, just depart from me because I'm a sinful man. But you know what? Jesus came to change your mind because that's the only way you overcome that obstacle. In fact, that's where we get our word repentance. It, it literally means metanoia in Greek, a change of mind. That's what repentance is, that when Jesus comes to you personally, 
He changes your mind. What used to be success to you no longer is success. What used to give you pleasure no longer gives you pleasure. What used to give you fear no longer even gives you pause because you've come face to face with him. I, I, I used to drill something into my sons and now I hear both of them say it to their children. And here it is. Everything in life is a, a trade-off. Everything in life is a trade-off. They'd come to me and they'd say, hey, I want, to do, I want to do such and such. I'd say, okay, let's talk about what you're trading in order to do that. So if you do that, that, that might even be a good thing. But let's, let's just think through what you're giving up in order to do that. And let's just do cost-benefit analysis. And this is exactly what the scripture wants us to do. We need to understand that everything in life is a trade-off. To follow God's call requires a trade-off. Uh, so Peter's been toiling all night but now comes to him the one who says come unto me all you who labor are heavy laden I'll give you rest man you've been working to make your own righteousness you've been trying to be good enough you've been trying to uh, earn God's favor you've been trying to do whatever you can to make sure that you're going to heaven or to make sure that you're a good person or that people pat you on the back and think this and that of you but Jesus comes and he says you know that's that's not even the right way of thinking you have no righteousness I've come to be your righteousness and so what he's asking you to trade off is to go from working for you to working for him so Peter you can keep catching stinking rotten fish or you can come with me and I'll make you a fisher of people in fact Jesus uses a word here when he says I'll make you catch it, it, it literally means live catch I'll make you live catch men and women you're going to catch living things you're not, you're not catching them to devour them you're catching them for eternal life I, 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 you're going to trade off making a living to making an eternity. You're working for a paycheck, but I'm going to have you work for reward in heaven. You've been working for treasure where the moth eats it and the rust corrupts it, but I'm going to teach you how to lay up treasure in heaven where there are no moths and there, are, there is no corruption, where you can have joy, not just for the span of this life, but forever. You've been working to have you have a house here and a vacation home there, but I'm going to give you a mansion. I'm going to give you an abiding place with me forever. What a trade-off, man, to, to trade what you cannot keep and what will not last for that which is eternal, and God will give you joy forever. You're going to trade off living in guilt over your sin to living in freedom. Man, Jesus shows up and he interferes with Peter's life and look at what he what he's offered I think you all know the impact Adrian Rogers great pastor in Bellevue Bellevue Baptist Church Adrian Rogers was just maybe the greatest man I've ever met and he had a tremendous impact on me I can remember when I first met him and I just thought man I'm gonna learn everything from him I can uh, I was pastoring in Lexington after I'd been in seminary, and I'd met him, been around him several times. He'd been very gracious to me. But, you know, Adrian Rogers was gracious to hundreds and hundreds of pastors. But uh, I was going to be preaching in Arkansas on a Monday, and I called uh, Adrian Rogers' secretary and said, Hey, I, I'm going to be coming through Memphis on that Sunday night. Would it be possible for Tanya and me to just maybe get to take Dr. Rogers and Joyce out for supper uh, after the service, and we'll be in Bellevue for the service at night. She said, I'll get back to you. She called back. She said, uh, hey, the pastor wants me to tell you that, you know, that night we're, we're having our big July 4th presentation, and uh, the choir's doing this presentation, and, and here's what he wants you to do. He wants you to park in his parking place. He gonna, he's going to park somewhere else. He's going to leave his parking place for you. 
You come around behind the building, you park right in where it says pastor. You park there. And there's a door there. So there's going to be a security team there to meet you. And they're going to take you into his study. And you and Tanya can have a little time with Pastor and Joyce before the service. And then they're going to, you're going to go into the service with them. He's not preaching that night because the choir's doing their thing. And, but you, the four of you are going to sit together during the service. And then afterward, you go out to, to dinner. Now, man, this is like, you know, the, the king has held out the golden scepter and said, approach the throne. I mean, like, does it get, you get any better treatment than that? So I preached that morning at Ashland Avenue. We get in our car and we got just enough time to get to Memphis in time for the evening service for all that to happen. We get to Nashville, Nashville. (laughs) And there's construction on I-65. It slows down. In fact, it just stops. We're, We're stuck on the north side of Nashville. And I mean, I'm watching that clock tick and, and at some point I realize we're not, we're not gonna make it. Here, I've been offered the Royal Scepter and I can't get there because of Nashville traffic. And I, I don't have a cell number or anything, you know, I'm trying, and the church office is closed. I'm trying to get in touch with them and tell them, you know, we're not gonna make it. And I had to call somebody that I knew had his cell and have him call and tell. And uh, the next thing I know, phone rings, and it's like, hey, don't worry about this. Uh, you just get here. Whenever you get here, we're going to wait on you, and it's fine. And Tony and I get there late, but his, his space is open, waiting for me. I pull in there. Security detail comes out. Are you the Yorks? Yes, we are. Come with us. They escort us right into the sanctuary, set us in the seat of honor. We go out that night with Joyce and, and uh, Adrian and I, I, I just can't tell you, man, he, Adrian had this way of when you were with him, he made you feel like you were as important as he was. It, it was just an amazing thing. I look back at that, and, you know, it, that night we got to know them real well. There were many other times after that that I got to be with him, and he invited me to stuff. He'd send me to stuff. Uh, and I, I would be, Adrian taught me a rule. You all Notice that I do this. If I'm standing out there talking to somebody, I'm going to stand here in this lobby and talk to you as long as anybody wants to talk. What I don't do is like look over your shoulder and everybody else is going around. I try and focus in on whoever's there. And Adrian taught me to do that. He, he said, just always deal with whoever's there. And whoever wants to talk to you, let them stand there and you be patient and give them the same attention that you gave this person. And I do that. We were at the Southern Baptist Convention one time and I saw Adrian talking to a bunch of people. There were a lot of people standing around him. And I thought, ah, you know, man, it'd take me forever to get to stand there and talk to him. So I, I wanted to say hi, but come on, Tiny, let's go. And Adrian Rogers stopped his conversation. He said, hey, Hurst, just wait a minute. I want to talk to you a minute. It's like, oh, son. This is, man, you got it, Adrian. You know what I mean? Listen. I want you to see that Jesus shows up that day, the multitude pressing in on him, but he calls Peter. And he is here today. He speaks to you. He speaks your name. He's a personal God. And out of the multitude, Jesus calls you. Does that not amaze you? As great as it felt for Adrian Rogers to do that with me, I'm going to tell you it's a million times, a million times better that Jesus says, Herschel, I came to save you. I came to call you. I love you. He knows your name. He knows what you've done to try to satisfy yourself. He, He knows how empty you are, yet he has come to your boat today. He's calling your name today. He's telling you to let down your net into the deep water of his love. And he's going to fill it with the only thing that will satisfy your soul. He's going to fill it with him and his righteousness. That is the amazing thing about our personal God. Now here's, I want you to get this. He calls you now. But this isn't the last time. Read the book of Revelation. 
what's heaven like? Man in Revelation describes the 24 elders seated around the throne. It describes the angels who are bowing thrice holy, 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 holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. They're worshiping him. There's a multitude of people from every nation, kindred, tribe, and tongue. But trust me on this. When you step out of this world into eternity, if you have responded to his call here, you're going to step into the multitude in heaven and he's going to look directly at you. And he's going to call you by name and he's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. I, you've been faithful in a few things. I'm going to make you ruler over many. And to think that he is a personal God, that he loves you personally. You're not just a number. You're just not one in a multitude. He came to die for you. He wants to spend eternity with you. He loves you. How can you turn your back on that love that out of the multitude, Jesus will welcome you if you'll receive him now.